Lord God, we want to thank you this morning that this is our king. We serve a king who was crucified for his people. That's our savior. That's our friend. That's our Lord. That is the one before whom we fall together in worship this morning. One who has suffered. One who paid for our sin. And one who rose again and now reigns victorious at your right hand. Lord, we want to be with that king. We want to be with that savior for all eternity. So would you help us even through the teaching of your word this morning to know how to build our lives and our relationships in community more around the cross of that king. Teach us, make us humble, and help us to love your people more. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Thank you, music team. <coughs> Ridiculous lawsuits. Ridiculous lawsuits. You guys have heard about the one where the lady sued McDonald's because the coffee was too hot. But here are a, a few. I, I looked up the list of the top 10 most ridiculous lawsuits from 2013, okay? So these are recent. These are real, and I picked a few of my favorite. Ridiculous lawsuits. Here's the first one. I love this one. A group of Idaho inmates blamed a life of crime on alcohol companies. A group of five inmates at Kuna, Idaho prison uh, facility sued a group of eight brewers for failing to warn them adequately of the dangers of alcohol. Here's the quotation from one of them. I have spent a great deal of time in prison because of situations that have uh, arisen, I'll correct his grammar, situations that have arisen because of people being drunk or because of situations in which alcohol played a major role. Others claim they would have never started drinking had they known about alcohol's addictive nature. The inmates don't have a lawyer and they have drafted the suit themselves. Here's another one. An Ohio teacher claimed fear of children in a suit against her school district. She's a 61-year-old teacher teaching uh, Spanish and French. She claims that she experiences stress, anxiety, chest pains, vomiting, nightmares, and high blood pressure when she spends time around young children. <laughs> a disability that she labels in her suit, pedophobia, <laughs> according to Fox News. So she sued the district for reassigning her from high school to middle school. And a federal judge dismissed the suit. Uh, just a couple, or three more, because these are really good. Two New Jersey men, you may have heard about this one because their, their photograph went viral. They sued Subway, the restaurant chain, because their foot-long sandwiches were only 11 inches long. Uh, they, the sub advertised as foot-long. They measured it. They took a picture of it at 11 inches. The photo went viral. Um, and here's their quotation. This case is about holding companies to deliver what they promised. Uh, a couple more. Uh, I really like this one, too. A grown man, a 32-year-old man in New York, sued his parents for their indifference to his problems. Um, he sued his parents primarily because they refused to give him $200,000 to open up two Domino's Pizza franchises. Um, he says that his parents' actions over the years have caused deep-rooted wounds that cannot heal on their own. They are indifferent to their children's problems, relationship, poverty, status, and station in life. And then the last one. A Tennessee man sued Apple for his porn addiction. One day, former attorney and amateur model Chris Sevier, Sevier accidentally typed something instead of Facebook on his Apple device and it led him to pornographic sites. Now he's suing the tech giant for selling him a machine with unrestricted internet access. He says, since Apple is concerned with the welfare of our nation's children, while furthering pro-American values, it should sell all of its devices in safe mode with software preset to filter out pornographic content, according to his lawsuit. <coughs> Ridiculous lawsuits. And I'm sure you guys could come up with a lot more that you've heard. Well, we come to 1 Corinthians 6. We're in our, in our series called Grow Up, Paul calling this church in Corinth to uh, 
They're, they're a gifted church, but he's calling them to more maturity in Christ. We've seen a lot of different issues that he's already put his finger on. We come to chapter 6, and we find that there are ridiculous lawsuits going on in the church in Corinth. They're not ridiculous, though, like these because of what they are about. They're actually about legitimate things. But they are ridiculous, as Paul will show us, because of who they involve. There are lawsuits between Christians who worship together as part of the community of faith in Corinth. So we're going to look at this uh, passage pretty quickly this morning. I know we had a lot of other things going on. But we're going to look, first of all, at verses 1 to 8, why Paul says these lawsuits going back and forth in Corinth are so ridiculous. And then in verses 9 to 11, we're going to see how he expands his conversation into a larger principle that's important for all of us to hear today. So first of all, the lawsuits themselves. I'm going to read verses 1 to 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You can kind of get a feel for how Paul is digging into this issue. So 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Don't you know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So here's the situation in Corinth. You have people who worship together, who are part of the same church body in Corinth, who are cheating each other out of money during the week. So you get this in verses 7 to 8. He finally gets to specifically what's going on. He uses the word defraud twice. You see it in verse 7 and then verse 8. So probably what's hap happening is you have some believers in the church in Corinth swindling each other out of sums of money. Maybe shoddy business deals, maybe selling people things that don't work quite right. And then they're showing up. And can you imagine sitting in church with somebody and you look over and you think, that person just uh, took me for $2,000 this past week. There they are in church together in Corinth. But then you see they're taking it one step further than simply the defrauding and the swindling, and they're suing each other. So verse 1, he, he goes to law. Paul says you go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints. Verse 4, if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? And then verse 6, brother going to law against brother before unbelieving judges. So you can imagine, again, a scene in Corinth. Okay, imagine a Corinthian court, and the judge is looking over the case. He says, okay, you claim that this person swindled you out of $2,000. Don't you guys go to church together? Aren't you both part of that new Christian thing that's going on in Corinth? What are you doing here? And you can begin to see why Paul might think this is a bit ridiculous. Well, there are two reasons why Paul says these lawsuits are so ridiculous. Two big reasons. The first one is about us as Christians. The second one is about the world. It's about the world that surrounds us as Christians. So the first reason Paul says it's so ridiculous for Christians in Corinth to be suing each other is that Christians should be able to deal with conflict themselves within the community of believers. We have wisdom given to us by God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and being part of a fellowship of believers to deal with conflict and to find reconciliation. That's Paul's first point. It's ridiculous because you guys need to deal with this stuff. And he gets there. It's fascinating. Look at verses 2 to 3 again. He gets there by actually looking at the future role of believers, the place that they will have in judgment alongside Jesus Christ over the world and even over the angelic beings. So verse 2 do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And then verse 3, do you not know that we are to judge angels? Here's an amazing thing that the Bible teaches. 
Jesus' death and his resurrection for us, which redeems us and makes us God's people, does not only spare us from God's judgment, it actually gives us a seat alongside Christ in his eternal reign and even judgment of the world. You see this in a few places. One place, is you, one place you see it is Revelation 3, verse 21. You don't need to turn there, but I'll just read Revelation 3, 21. Jesus says to the church in Laodicea, actually, as he's calling them to repent, he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And then he, he goes on to say in verse 3, you'll also judge angels. So because of our status as the redeemed, God's people, we will actually have a more exalted role in the new heavens and new earth than the angelic beings. Beings that if we saw now, we would fall down and worship. We'd be so terrified of their presence. Paul's point then is pretty obvious. If that's your future, if that's what you're headed toward, if that's your heritage to actually reign and judge alongside your Savior, then how can you not deal with this stuff in the context of the church? You have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. You're with the fellowship of believers. You need to be able to find reconciliation without going before a judge to try to get your $2,000 back. That's his point. So how much more should you be able to deal with cases in this life? Now, Paul doesn't go into a lot of detail about how to deal with this, how saints are in the context of the church in Corinth supposed to deal with this conflict. But he would probably be aware of other places in Scripture that do speak to that. So Matthew 18, for example. And you've probably heard of the Matthew 18 principle. That's something that we use here in our elder council often as we think about how to deal with conflict and even how to deal with discipline issues in the church. So Matthew 18, Jesus says, here's what you do if your brother's wronged you. First you go and confront your brother, just you. Then if he doesn't listen to you, you bring another believer with you, and you together confront the sinner. And then if he still doesn't listen, then you involve the church. You involve the whole community of God's people. If he still doesn't listen, then there are more extreme measures to take. And you begin to treat him like an unbeliever, someone who's continuing in persistence. <coughs> So we do have instructions like that in Scripture, how we can deal with conflict in the context of the church. Now, I want to make a quick caveat here. This passage is not teaching us that we should have nothing to do with any kind of legal system or legal proceeding that involves another Christian. That's not what this passage is teaching. So if you see someone from your church commit murder, it's okay to testify against them in court. Okay, So we have to measure a passage like this against passages like Romans 13, in which Paul affirms the role of the government, actually says that the government, so long as they are operating in a just way, are actually instruments of God. Governors are instruments of God to exert justice. And in general, Christians should be submissive to their government. That's the teaching of Romans chapter 13. But what he is saying specifically in this instance is look, if you're wronged financially, if someone swindles you out of money and it's another believer in the context of the church, you don't drag that person into court. That's not how you deal with something like this. Well, I want to apply this first point just a little bit. Because my guess is that none of you are involved right now with lawsuits uh, with other people in the college ministry. At least I hope you're not suing each other. But there may be instances in your lives right now when you are at an irreconcilable pass with another Christian. You've got a conflict that you're having trouble resolving. And if that's the case, I think this passage begins to speak to you. That you, in light of your future role of reigning and judgment alongside Jesus Christ, your Savior, should be able to achieve reconciliation with other believers with whom you have conflict. You ought to be able to chase, pursue, and achieve reconciliation to that conflict. Uh, I can think of many times, uh, for, for me personally in high school and college, uh, the arena that usually got me in most conflict with people in my relationships was the arena of competition. So I can remember many nights in college, uh, coming home after practice and then after dinner, having to call, this was back when they actually had phones on the walls in the dorm rooms, but having to pick up the phone and call a teammate and say, you know what, I lost my temper, I said something I really regret now, or I 
pushed you or got mad or lost my temper. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? I never regretted doing that. And I wonder if there's someone, if there's some relationship in your life with another believer today that you need to go after, that you need to pick up the phone and make a call about for the sake of reconciliation. Maybe it's even a damaged relationship that's beginning to bleed out publicly before an unbelieving world, as we'll talk about in just a moment. And if that's the case, it's even more urgent. Make the call. Pursue reconciliation. Ask forgiveness. You're going to one day, if you're in Christ, be seated with him, judging the world, judging the angels. You can deal with this conflict now. So that's the first reason these lawsuits are so ridiculous. They're ridiculous because Christians should be able to deal with this stuff. Now, here's the second one. I told you the first one was about us as Christians. The second reason these lawsuits are so ridiculous has to do with the world. And Paul basically says, you guys are fighting with each other, and the world is watching. In other words, it's incredibly damaging to your witness. And he's trying to actually shame them. Look at verses 4 to 6 as he kind of highlights this. Let me read those verses one more time. He says, so if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one... Um, among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. In other words, before the eyes of the world. Paul wants them to be ashamed of the way they're fighting with each other on display for all the world to see. I saw a, uh, a clip, a little video clip the other day that someone sent me. It was a, Brazilian, a professional Brazilian soccer match, or football match, whatever you want to call it. And it, it, it was fascinating because two players got in a fight with each other, and it kind of escalated, and they were shoving each other, and actually as the fight got broken up, one player took a kick, a final kick at the midsection of the other player. But what was so hilarious about this fight is that they were two members of the same team <laughs> who were fighting with each other. And when everything had kind of settled down, the referee uh, card, red, gave a red card to one of the players and threw him out of the game for fighting with his own teammate. And it was amazing to watch the other team just kind of look and watch this, like kind of in amazement. A few of them kind of laughing as two teammates shove each other, kick each other, and one of them gets kicked out of the game. That's, a, I think, a brilliant picture. It's a sad picture, but the right one of what Paul is demonstrating here. He's saying, you guys are part of the same team, the same church, the same body of Christ, and you're fighting on display before these people that you're supposed to be having a witness to for the sake of Christ. Really, really shameful. The world is looking on. We are actually interacting with each other, called to love each other, before unbelievers, in front of people who don't yet know Jesus Christ. And let me take this just a step further as you consider this in your own life. And as we consider this as a college ministry, as a church, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. If we cannot pursue and find reconciliation with each other, <laughs> How can we claim to bear witness to the one who reconciles sinners to God? If we can't reflect forgiveness and grace in our relationships, how do we hope to make evident and clear the God who reconciles and brings forgiveness to us? You see how damaging that is to our witness? The world is looking on. Well, Paul presents a better way, and then we'll, we'll get on to the second point. In verses 7 to 8, he basically says, look, it would be better for you to actually take the wrong. Just take it. 7 to 8. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brother. What Paul is putting forward, he doesn't say it explicitly. But what Paul is putting forward here as the right way to go about dealing with wrong in verses 7 and 8 is a cross-shaped, cross-driven response to someone wronging you. Sometimes in premarital counseling, when, when, when my wife and I are meeting with, with young couples that are about to get married, we'll talk about conflict and we'll talk about anger and, and disagreements. And the need for one person at some point, if you're going to ever diffuse the conflict, 
to absorb the blow, to absorb the words or the insult or the hurt and stop. At some point, someone has to actually absorb it without retaliation. You guys know what that's like when you're in an argument with someone or when you're going back and forth with someone else. Words keep flying back and forth. They bounce, they bounce, they bounce. It doesn't stop until one person decides, okay, I'm going to take it and I'm not going to respond. And let me tell you, the only way you can do that, if you're in that kind of a situation today with another believer, the only way you can absorb it is by understanding, embracing, and rejoicing that you have a Savior who absorbed the final blow for your sin in your place on your behalf. That's actually the only way you can be empowered to show grace to another person and not retaliate. It's knowing that you have a Savior who took every single one of your, your blows, your stripes, your abuse in your place. He absorbed it without sending any back your way. Full grace, full abuse, full torture on the cross in your place. And so you can forgive. And so when someone in the context of believers wrongs you, insults you, hurts you, is passive aggressive toward you in your suite in Fisher Dorm, you can absorb it. And say, I've been forgiven. I'm going to show them grace because of what Jesus has done for me. I wonder what that looks like for you this week. I wonder if there's a situation that has been continuing. Maybe it's with your roommate. Maybe it's with a teammate. Maybe it's with a fellow person in the conservatory or just a classmate. Maybe it's a family member. But I want to challenge you. If there's something going back and forth, back and forth, is it not better to suffer wrong? Only Jesus can enable you to do that. Only seeing your sin on him can allow you to do that. So ridiculous lawsuits, why are they ridiculous? Christians ought to be able to deal with these things. And then number two, the world is watching. The world is looking on as we fight with each other. Well, in verses 9 to 11, just quickly as we close, what Paul does is he makes a, a bigger principle out of this discussion. So he's been talking about lawsuits, but then here he, he expands the conversation. He does this just like he did in 1 Corinthians 5, when we were talking about sexual immorality in the church, and then he expanded the discussion, not just to sexual sinners, but people who were greedy, people who were idolaters, people who were swindlers. He does this here too, and he makes it not just about lawsuits, but about those who continue in unrighteousness. So look at verses 9 to 10. He says, don't be deceived. Sorry, he doesn't say that. <laughs> That's his attitude. I have that in my notes. His attitude is he doesn't want them to be deceived. Let me actually read verse 9. Okay. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Oh, there, there he says it. Don't be deceived. <laughs> I knew I didn't make that up. Neither the sexual, sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, same thing going on in the context right here, will inherit the kingdom of God. So the first thing Paul does, I think it's incredibly important, is he identifies that not everyone involved in this situation may actually be genuine Christians. And I think that's important for me as a pastor for spiritual leaders to do as we deal with a situation of ongoing sin. That's what Paul does here. He says, don't be deceived if this characterizes your life. If you are a serial um, adulterer, if you are a serial uh, swindler, idolater, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If this characterizes your life. It's a little bit like Paul is saying, at some point, if sin continues, if there's this ongoing sin, whether it's swindling or lawsuits or sexual sin or whatever, if it looks like a duck and sounds like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. In other words, you may not actually be a genuine Christian. You may not actually be a member of the kingdom of God. So the first thing Paul does is he deals with this sin is he gives this warning you may not actually be an inheritor of the kingdom of God. But then look at 11. Because here he goes back to the Christians. To those who may be struggling with this sin. They may be fighting. They may have irreconcilable differences with other believers. 
He reminds them of who they are. Look at verse 11. He says, and such were some of you. That's who you used to be. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. There are some of you who are struggling with this sin, Paul is saying. And you just need to be reminded that that's not who you are anymore. That's what you used to be. You used to be a swindler. You used to be someone who would not show forgiveness to a fellow believer and would actually drag him or her before a judge in court. That's not who you are anymore. Who are you? Who are you today if you're in Christ? You're washed. You've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're sanctified. You've been made holy. You've been set apart for God's use. And you're justified. You've been declared legally right and righteous before God. Live like it. You used to be that other way. Remember who you are and live like it. Well, I need to wrap up. Uh, here, here's just my concluding remarks. If you are in Christ, if you are in Christ today, and I hope that all of you are, if you know him as your Savior, you are called to reconcile. You're called to reconciliation with other believers. Stop metaphorically dragging your brothers and sisters before the judges in Corinth. Absorb it. Better to suffer wrong because of what Jesus, your Savior, has suffered in your place. You can do it. You're one day going to be seated with Christ, ruling over the world and judging the angels. You can reconcile with your brother or sister. And you have to do it for the sake of your witness. The world is watching us. The world looks on. And as they see our love, as they see our forgiveness, our grace toward one another, they can be directed toward the grace and love of Jesus our Savior. Or they can be turned off like that soccer team watching the other players fight with each other. Let me pray. We're going to end with just singing one song. Heavenly Father, we, we come again to a passage in Corinthians that reminds us that this was such a flawed, imperfect church. And yet, Lord, we remember again the way that Paul began this letter by calling these men and women saints, by rejoicing in the fact that you would keep them secure and actually find them blameless on the last day in Christ. God, there are parts of our lives today that you need to clean up by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that we would be willing as we engage in the battle against sin and Lord, specifically for those here today who are harboring resentment or hatred or a lack of forgiveness toward other believers, I pray that they would, because of the grace they have found in Jesus, forgive and reconcile for the sake of their own hearts and souls and for the sake of their witness to the world around them. God, let us be like Jesus to one another. And we pray that in his name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing our last song here. Um, there's a verse that talks about uh, the generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith. And I think that's a good way to think about uh, what we just heard from John. Um, a people, because of God's love, because of God's mer mercy and washing over our sin, responding with selfless faith. So let's sing Hosanna.
Heal my heart and make it clean. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart. Break my heart for what breaks yours. And everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from birth into eternity. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. John says in 1 John chapter 5, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? As we follow Jesus, let's love each other with the love that he has loved us. It's a love that was demonstrated perfectly, fully on a cross. And we're called to walk in that love. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you absorbed the final blow Lord, the full wrath, punishment for our sin. And so would you free us from needing vengeance, from needing a last word, from needing retaliation, from needing a continuing conflict. And would you help us to show grace so that others might come to know you as well. Amen.